The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 between two students and their tutor. The students are doing a research project on computer use. Listen to the conversation carefully and answer questions 1 through 5. First, you have some time to look at the questions. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 through 5. Dr. Barrett? Sammy, come in. Is Irene with you? Yes. Good. Sit down. Right. We're looking at how far you've got with your research project since we last met. Uh, you decided to do a survey about computer facilities at the university, didn't you? That's right. We decided to investigate the university's open access to a computer when they need one, so we thought it would be a useful area to research. Good. It's not a topic anyone has looked at before, as far as I know, uh, so it's a good choice. So what background reading did you do? Well, we looked in the catalogs in the library, but we couldn't find much that was useful. It's such a specialized subject. Hardly anything seems to have been published about it. And as well as that, the technology is all changing so quickly. But the Open Access Center has an online questionnaire on computer use that it asks all the students to do at the end of their first year, and the supervisor give us access to that data. So we used it as a starting point for our research. It wasn't exactly what we needed but it gave us an idea of what we wanted to find out in our survey. Then we designed our own questionnaire. And how did you use it? We approached students individually and went through our questionnaire with them on a one-to-one -one basis. So you actually asked them the questions? That's right. We made notes of the answers as we went along. And actually, we found we got a bit of extra information that way as well. About the underlying attitudes of the people we were interviewing, by observing the body language and things like that. How big was your sample? Well, altogether, we interviewed a random sample of 65 students, 55% male and 45% female. And what about the locations and times of the survey? We went to the five open access computer centers at the university and we got about equal amounts of data at each one. It took us three weeks. We did it during the week, in the day and in the evenings. Not the weekends? No. So presumably your respondents were mostly full-time students. Yes. Oh, you mean we should have collected some data at the weekends from the part-time students? We didn't think of that. Okay. It's just an example of how difficult it is to get a truly random sample. So how far have you got with the analysis of results? Well, everyone agrees there was a problem, but we're more interested in what they think should be done about it. The most popular suggestion was for some sort of booking system. About 77% of the students thought that would be best. But there were other suggestions. For example, about 65% of people thought it would help if the opening hours were longer, like 24 hours a day. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Choice 1. Listen to the following talk and choose the correct answer for each question. 
The Atlantic Ocean, named for the legendary lost island of Atlantis, has made up for the romantic origin of its name by becoming the most important commercial highway in the world. Yet traces of romance continually mingle with the business of the sea. For instance, the Spanish adventurers who first sought gold and silver in America frequently found their ships becalmed, usually on the edge of the steady trade winds, about thirty degrees north or south latitude. A sailing ship could carry only so much water, and as it lay motionless under a hot sun for days or weeks, the tortures of thirst were agonizing. The horses were generally the first victims. They had to be thrown overboard when they died or became crazed with thirst. Because the Spanish caballeros thought highly of their horses, even crediting them with souls, they suffered great remorse and believed the ghosts of the proud war horses were haunting the scene. They saw the restless spirits in their dreams and related their dreams to sailors. Whenever the mariners passed that way, they would see in the spray or clouds images of wild horses bearing down on them. They began to call the broad belts of calm the horse latitudes, the romantic name by which they are known today. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. The student union is having a meeting to discuss how to help the community. As you listen, complete the summary by writing no more than two words on each line. First, you will have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. May I have your attention, please? We're going to start the meeting now. I'm very pleased to see so many people here. You obviously all know that the purpose of this meeting is to discuss how to help the community. Next month, the National Union of Students are running a National Community Week. They've asked us to cooperate in any way we can. The idea is that all students should give up some of their time to help the community. Surely that's what we do in Rag Week. Does that mean we're going to do this sort of thing twice a year? No, not really. The scheme is nationwide. It has two aims. To show the public that students are responsible members of society and to show students ways in which they can give really practical help to the community. The National Union of Students haven't made any suggestions. They want the students in each area to work out their own schemes. And really, that's the purpose of this meeting to think up some ideas about the sort of help we can give. Let's discuss now. Any suggestions? It is Saturday morning. A group of students are going to help an old man in the community. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Where is Milkman Street? Is it far? No, I don't think so. It's somewhere near. Oh, look there. It's just around the corner. What's the number again? Number 8. Mr Tyler, 8 Milkman Street. Careful with those tins of paint. I'll knock. The welfare office said that they'd written to him to tell him we were coming. The curtains are all drawn. It doesn't look as if anyone's at home. He's probably watching TV. He's a long time coming. He'll be pleased to see us, I'm sure. 
Go away. I don't want any. Hello, Mr. Tyler. Is it Mr. Tyler, isn't it? We're the student volunteers. Engineers? I don't want any engineers. I've got a gas fire. No, Mr. Tyler. We've come to do your decorating. No, thank you. Not today. Perhaps you could open the door, Mr. Tyler. We've come to paint your kitchen. Well, why didn't you say so? We can come again tomorrow if it's inconvenient now. No, no, no. It's all right. Don't stay there at the front. Come round the back. I never use the front door, only the back. Who is it? It's the student volunteer. Hello, you're the student volunteer, aren't you? Yes. Good afternoon. The welfare office told me to come here. My name is Diana. Yes, they wrote to me about this. Come in, please. There. Isn't that nice and comfy? That's lovely, dear. And warm too. It's really cosy in here. I wish I could get about a bit more, like you young people. I could go out and see my son and my grandchildren. They live in Edinburgh, you know. I don't see them often. My son has got a lot of work. I used to go out to work. That was after my husband died. Never worked when I was married, though. No. No, never. He used to say a woman's place is in the home. Yes, life's like that. I'll just dust these photos. That's him, the one in the middle of the front row. His moustache was lovely. That was taken when he was in the army. He looks very smart. Yes, he was. I can remember it as if it were yesterday. Well, there we are. I want you to read a book to me. You know my eyes are not very good now. Where is the book? It's on my desk. It is Little Dorrit by Dickens. You know the bit I like. It's on page two hundred and one. It describes Little Dorrit's love for her father. Ah, yes. Here, she never left him. Nice and comfortable. Here, put this shawl around your shoulders. My husband used to read this book to me. She never left him all that night, as if she had done him a wrong which her tenderness could hardly repair. She sat by him in his sleep, at times softly kissing him. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part, part three. three. You will hear part of a talk on cultural research. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Having referred briefly to the general definition of culture, I want to move on to an example of cultural research in action, a real example of what researchers into culture are doing. This is a study done in 2004 into the global teenager hypothesis. Now, the Global Teenager Hypothesis states that the values and attitudes of teenagers all over the world have become very similar, that teenagers are part of a global culture, rather than a national or a regional one. This study investigated the subject of materialism in three different cultures. It asked if teenagers' attitudes to materialism were similar or different in those three different cultures. I'd like to go through the main points of this study because I think it demonstrates the interest and usefulness of this kind of research. The research took a sample of 556 high school students of between 14 and 17 years of age from three countries. The three countries 
being also three differing cultures, were China, Japan and the USA. The high schools were in medium-sized cities and the students came from middle-class areas. There were 172 respondents from China, 168 from Japan and 216 from the USA. The students were asked to reply to a questionnaire or survey which consisted of seven statements. They were asked to say if they agreed or disagreed with the statements. The questionnaire was filled in during the students' regular class time. I'll give you some examples of the statements in the questionnaire. And, by the way, if you want to look into this in further detail, I've got the reference here. Let me see. Oh yes, it's the International Journal of Consumer Studies, Volume 28, Number 4 of September 2004. The first statement was, It is really true that money can make you happy. Respondents were asked, as they were asked about all the statements, to give their answer on a scale of 1 to 7. One on the scale indicated, I strongly disagree. Four on the scale was neutral. And seven on the scale was, I strongly agree. The second statement was, My dream in life is to be able to own expensive things. And the fifth was, Having the right possessions is the most important thing in life. Let's look at some of the results. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. I'm sure. Let's look at some of the results. With regard to the first statement, it was the Japanese teenagers who agreed most strongly that money could make you happy. The Americans were second and the Chinese agreed least. However, regarding one's life dream being to own expensive things, it was American teenagers who agreed most strongly with this and the Chinese who agreed least. As regards the fifth statement about owning the right things, the Americans agreed less strongly than the other two groups. It was the Chinese who agreed most strongly with this statement. I haven't been able to analyse all aspects of the study in this lecture, but it does suggest that the hypothesis is not supported by the data. It may be that the culture of the USA is more individualistic, whereas the Chinese culture is more collectivist or communitarian. However, it does not seem to support the global teenager hypothesis. As always, this is something on which we need to carry out more research. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a lecturer talking about the International English Language Teaching System, IELTS. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Remember to write no more than two words or a number for each answer. Hello everyone. Now, the International English Language Testing System exam, or IELTS as it's better known, is one of the most successful and popular English language exams in the world today. What we're going to look at now is the history of IELTS and how it came to be so successful. The story starts back in the 1960s when the British Council created an exam called EPTB to test international applicants wanting to study at universities and colleges in the UK. EPTB, by the way, stood for English Proficiency Test Battery. Strange name, I know. This exam mainly used multiple choice questions and by the end of the 1970s was considered a little old-fashioned. So, in 1980, it was replaced by ELTS, the English Language Testing Service. This new exam was much more modern in approach. It was much more communicative, for example, and was intended to reflect how language was used in the real world, particularly in the academic context of universities and colleges. However, during the 1980s, the number of candidates taking the test was quite low. For example, only 4,000 people took the test in 1981. It's true that this had risen to 10,000 by 1985, but if you compare that to the number of candidates who take IELTS each year these days, more than a million, you can see why they considered it to be quite small. There were also some practical problems with the test. So, in 1987, it was decided to conduct a review, leading to a revised version of the exam. This was introduced in 1989 under its new name, IELTS. Over the next few years, the number of candidates increased rapidly. In 1995, there were over 43,000 candidates and it was possible to take the test in any one of 210 test centres around the world. 1995 was also the year of the next revision to the exam, which simplified the reading module and also improved exam administration. Further minor changes followed. The speaking module was altered in 2001 and the criteria for marking the writing tasks were revised in 2005. In the same year, a computerised version of the exam was offered at certain test centres. 2003 was a milestone for IELTS as it was the year when the number of candidates went over half a million for the first time. There's no doubt that today, with, as we said, a candidature more than double what it was back in 2003, IELTS is a major player in the highly competitive industry of English language examinations. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.